Welcome in. Watch Right with Nick Wright, episode 221. And first in pod episode, I'm going to guess 64. Sure. This So alongside me, if you're watching on YouTube, is Danny Parkins from The Score in Chicago, Andrew Filipponi from 93.7 The Fan in Pittsburgh, who also hosts the First in Pod podcast. And you might be listening to this on the First in Pod podcast feed. If you are and you don't know who I am, my name is Nick Wright. I host What's Right with Nick Wright, which is what you're watching on YouTube now, potentially, and also First Things First on FS1. So these gentlemen... We're at this bougie radio conference yesterday, hobnobbing with radio celebrities. I got I, I was involved as well because my my roots are radio. These gentlemen also are going to be on First Things First today. And so we are doing our first ever What's Right with Nick Wright First in Pod crossover episode. I'm going to give the audience a little recap of what First and Pod is during the NFL season. They do two pods a week. The kind of catch line is every team, every week, every game, every team, every week, every team, every week, every game. They run through the entire league. So with free agency kind of coming to a close, not done yet, mm-hmm. but the you know the first week is over, we are going to do that same thing here where we will touch on all 32 teams, not necessarily in order of importance, but in order it occurred to us. And so, Danny, Andrew, thank you for joining us, and thank you for having me on the First in Pod feed, which people should subscribe to. As I've told the audience, it's my favorite weekly NFL pod during the offseason. It's weekly during the season twice a week. Gentlemen, how's it going? It's great, man. Thank you for having us. I love this crossover idea. Yeah. It's like sharing the work burden. I was going to say it made my life a lot easier this week. (laughs) All right. So that's what I care about. As we were on our way home from quite an interesting dinner that Andrew Filipponi set up with maybe America's most prominent local talk radio host, Greg Giannotti, who had just takes on takes on takes. I thought we were going to get thrown out of Mr. Chow's. My guy, Gio, and he can, uh, I'm fine with him saying this, I think had 11. Grey Goose sodas with a splash of crayon. The splash of crayon felt unnecessary, but I don't know, when you're going dozen drinks in. So that was a good night. On the way back from that, we found out that Keenan Allen had been traded to the Bears, which we'll get to in a moment, and that the Chiefs' perfect offseason continues. Hollywood Brown, who, listen, I don't want to overstate it because I don't think Hollywood Brown is a great player. I think he has a lot of potential and high upside. But he was, at worst, the third best wide receiver that could be available in this free agency. Tell me if you disagree. Mike Evans, Michael Pittman, Hollywood Brown were the top three. Is there? Is there... You forgot Calvin Ridley. So okay. I think you can make a Darnell Mooney argument. Like if Mooney went to the Chiefs, I think he would put up really good numbers. But so, so I th- I think Hollywood Brown's better than Darnell Mooney. Ridley, you're right. I did leave him out. Uh, and so, all right, so top four. The distinction is, of course, the Chiefs got him for one year, seven million bucks, which is perfect. Yep. And this is this is the benefit to being the Chiefs. And I know that's I know people are irritated hearing it. There is it is the opposite of a bad team tax. You get the great quarterback compete for a Super Bowl try to rebuild my value discount. So while Chris Jones did not give them a hometown discount, I feel like one year, seven million. I think, let me ask you guys this. Are the Chiefs the only team in the league that Hollywood Brown would play for for this contract? One year, seven million bucks. It can be 11 million if he hits all his incentives. Is there another team in the league that he would agree to that contract for? Because I say no. Probably not. I mean, obviously going to a high volume passing offense with a guy who's going to throw the ball, you know, 500, 600 times, you know, Buffalo would be interesting. Cincinnati would be interesting. But why Cincinnati? They've, uh, Higgins is going to play on the franchise tag there, though. No, no right? question about it. But I'm just saying, like going going to it's an elite quarterback thing. If he's trying to sign a one year deal and for the Chiefs, I agree with you. There's no bad one year deal in the NFL. You just would go. He would rank it Chiefs, and then after that, some of the teams that I mentioned. So you want to go? You want to go to the best quarterbacks possible. So you mentioned Buffalo. Do we think Curtis Samuel is a better player than Hollywood Brown? A better equivalent, worse? I would say a touch worse. Yeah, that's what I would say. Okay. Yeah. Curtis Samuel is just signed with Buffalo for three years, twenty-four million, fifteen million guaranteed. Point that I'm making there is. 
I don't think people are giving Buffalo. I don't think there is a Josh Allen Buffalo Bills discount. I don't think they've earned. Like I don't think. I, I think that people are excited to play with him, and I think there is. You know, it makes it an attractive place. But I don't think that they got Curtis Samuel on a bargain. I think that that is kind of paying a hundred cents on the dollar for a player of Curtis's uh, caliber, which is that is not an expensive contract, but two, uh, three year deal where the first two years are guaranteed. And I don't know that this means Hollywood Brown is a chief in two years, but it means that they now, and this is why I think it's such an important move. And then we can move on the chiefs because of this move don't have any position. They must use the 32nd pick on. If they had signed no receivers, then you almost are mandated to use that pick, the 32nd pick on a wide receiver. Now, Pony, I think they could draft a tackle there. I think they could draft a receiver there. I also think they could draft a D tackle or a corner there. The you know, corner because they think they're gonna lose Snead, D tackle because they haven't drafted any D tackles since Mahomes has been drafted in the first five rounds and Chris Jones getting older, even with the extension. So they truly, I know it sounds cliche, they truly can just go best player available. Uh, for me, like I don't I don't look at Brown as the type of move that changes how I feel about them. If they if they don't make the Brown signing, I still think they're the best team in the NFL, right? But I'm, so here's but here's what I wanted to ask you. So you said it's been the perfect off season for them so far. What what has to happen with Snead to keep that going? Well, I think that right now it's six one half dozen the other. I think that they've made it clear they are not trading him for anything worse than a top forty pick. Do you think they will? I at this point I do not. So, so you think he'll play on the tag? Yes. So I think that and he won't be a distraction about it. He'll show up the first week. There's no hold in. There's no Chris Jones carried into the season. He's a good soldier because oh, he's well, going I, for a Super Bowl. I'll be honest. I don't know that he'll show up the when you say first week of the off season, I don't think that. But I do I think he would miss a game? No. Okay. Because the thing the distinction between Snead and Chris Jones was Chris Jones was finishing his second contract after being, I think, a sec, uh, second round pick, and he was on a four-year $80 million the last year of it. Sneed was a fourth round pick who's never made any money. And listen, I love Sneed, and I hope at some point he gets paid either by the Chiefs or by someone else, but this one-year $20 million franchise tag is 4x what he has made cumulatively in his career. Every game he plays under the tag, he makes more money than he had made in any year of the NFL. So him missing a game, I don't think is going to happen. And I so it, there was a, I had a hope. A hope is the wrong word because I'm fine with him playing on the tag. I thought Detroit at 29 was a, I thought that made a lot of sense for both teams, but when Detroit then trades for Carlton, Carlton Davis, Davis yeah. to me it makes it less likely, and they become more likely if they're going to use that 29th pick to trade for someone that T. Higgins, you know what I mean, the other franchise tag uh, option is more likely. Okay, that's enough Chiefs here because, again, that while this is what's right, it's also first in pod. Now, Danny, to your team. Now the, we're talking about an NFC powerhouse. Okay, let's go, let's get into it. Well, I mean, they had all this cap space. They had the third most cap position of any team in the league, and the moves that they made were seemingly like they were, you know, secondary or tertiary players. Kevin Byard, free safety. DeAndre Swift, running back. A trade for Ryan Bates, sixth offensive lineman, maybe potential starter. Uh, Simone Biles' husband. You know, you know, like it's just it was like what is what are they waiting for? What are they going to use the money? On they need to upgrade. They had a needed edge rusher. People thought the Neil Hunter. They still could use an elite three three tech. I was thinking Christian Wilkins was a possibility. But it's why you got to be patient and you got to not only know your own roster, but you got to know the rest of the league. A fourth round pick for one year of Keenan Allen, who yes will be thirty two by the time the season starts, and he missed four games this past year. In the thirteen games that he played, he was simply excellent. He's a six time Pro Bowler, and now that offense with DJ Moore, Keenan Allen. Cole Komet, a soon-to-be significant upgrade at quarterback with Caleb Williams, and whatever they choose to do with the ninth pick, whether it is an edge rusher, whether it's trade down a little bit and target Brock Bowers, or if Adunze or somehow Malik Neighbors falls, truly investing and turning them into arguably the best receiving core in the league if you had a first-round pick receiver at nine, the Bears are stacked to have the best offense that they've had in my lifetime. 
So do you think well, you, you well, made ser- a face, Tony? Well, you just don't see teams who are going to start a rookie quarterback make one year short term invest in this moment, the right now moves like this. Well, do you thir- think the investment is more the money or the draft pick they gave up? No, I'm saying you're making a deal for Keenan Allen with no expectation or guarantee that he's going to be with you beyond Caleb Williams' first rookie year. But you know, we don't know yet. Like they could, they could rework the contract and sign him to an extension to lower the cap hit for this year. Maybe. I think, I think that would be a mistake. I think that the the because so I agree with a lot of Danny's optimism on the Bears. A lot of it. I think that that division, while the Packers are good and the Lions are very good, the division doesn't have, it, in my opinion, a juggernaut. The NFC obviously is the weaker of the two conferences, and the Bears won seven games last year. People have to be reminded constantly they have the number one pick because Carolina was terrible, not because they were terrible. Where the trepidation comes in is the exercise we did yesterday, you know, around midnight when we got back to my house, which was 32-year-old receivers in the league last year. I just threw it out there, and I said, how many do we think had 500 yards? And the answer to that question ended up being Adam Thielen, who had 1,000 yards, and that's it. The 32-plus-year-old receivers last year were the following people. Marquise Goodwin, 67 yards. Marvin Jones, 35 yards. (laughs) Randall Cobb, 39 yards. Uh, Adam Thielen, who I mentioned. Julio Jones, 74 yards, and that's the list. And so the concern is that, you know what I mean, that 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 position, that age, what is he going to have left? I don't mind, but I say all that to say this, because it's not an extension. If they give him an extension and rework the deal, I will feel differently. Andrew, for one year, I don't mind it, and to support Caleb as much as possible and give him the best chance to hit. I'm just surprised that a team that isn't closer to winning didn't try to make a one-year deal work with Allen. That's all. But it takes a unique set of circumstances. Because of his cap hit. You, you I got, get that. you got to have the cap space. The Chargers asked him to restructure the money down to help them out. He said no. They traded him. And so I, let me I'm ask, with you on the 32-year-old thing, just real quick. 1,200 yards, 108 catches, and seven touchdowns in and 13 I think his games. Game, I think his style of play ages well. He's not a guy that, to me, is like... He needs to be a physical freak or, you know, speed merchant in order to make plays. No, he's a but, technician. Right. He let, oddly has, like, some Travis Kelsey similarities to him. And he, Kelsey is 34 and had a gr- almost 1,000. To me, years. he's like a souped-up version of Keenan McCardell, who played into his 30s and had that same style of play. Let me ask you this, though. You said that this is a unique situation. The ceiling for rookie quarterback situations in terms of how far you can go with them would be... Uh, a championship game, right? Conference championship game. Joe Flacco, Baltimore, Sanchez, New York, Purdy, yeah. San Francisco. How far away? For, like you say, this is a you know unbelievable. A quarterback, a rookie quarterback, is not. Do you think that that's actually in? I don't see why not. The I, I mean, I, I honestly, I don't see why not. Why why couldn't the Bears win eleven games this year? So I think winning eleven games is probably more likely than being in the NFC title game. But right now, this moment. My, my, if, if you said all the outcomes are available, pick the one that you think is most likely. I think it is more, I think the most likely outcome is a wild card berth and a loss in round one. Great season. Which would be a great season. It would be, and it would be, it would feel better, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, Danny, than this when you had that with Mitch Trubisky or when you had that previously because it would feel like because of the quarterback that is something to truly build on correct it would that it was so I guess the, what I just described there is what Houston just had with CJ I right. think that is I think that is a realistic expectation for the Chicago Bears this year well and I mean the Bears defense is good <laughs> I think you overstate how good it is okay they they got better as the year went on as they got healthier. They have an elite player at all three levels of the defense. They've got a lot of young talent. They had Jalen Johnson, yeah. all pro corner. They have Tremaine Edmonds, who's one of the best coverage linebackers in the NFL. And they have Montez Sweat. 
I think calling Montez and Tremaine elite lowers the bar to, for elite for they're me. Getting paid like they're elite. The they're, I don't know that Montez is getting paid like he's elite. Yes, he he's is. Getting he, he got a big contract. I, well, uh, well, what's the contract? Because I think he's getting paid like he's the tenth best guy, which is the they, they, so that's a tier down from elite. Then yeah, that's what I. Okay, they, they they have a very good upper echelon player at all three levels of the defense plus. Four for 98. I, I, I'm just, I, if I were in your shoes, I would just be incensed that they prioritized carrying momentum over with the defense instead of let's get a head coach in here who's going to optimize. That's almost a different discussion. It is, it is a different discussion. The, it was a fork in the road. I don't moment. actually think it is, though. Because if we're talking about what they can do this year, obviously a lot of it is can Caleb Williams have a season that's similar to what C.J. Stroud had last year. And I think without that coaching infrastructure, I have doubts about that happening right off the bat. But nobody would have right said the very beginning. nobody would have said that Bobby Slowick was going to be the key to unlocking C.J. Stroud last year. He's special. So yeah, no, that's and listen, slowly and tell the audience who the Bears' new offensive coordinator is. Shane Waldron, the Shane, guy, the guy from Seattle who helped Geno Smith have the breakout season two years ago. The I would so the reason I mentioned that is Slowick was a total unknown, which to me allows for maybe a little more upside. Well, look at the coaching than, tree he came from. The, right? well, well, and just because we hadn't, we have seen Shane Waldron be, and now the higher floor as well than a guy that's total unknown. But we listen. If we're going to do every team, yeah, yeah, for no, free we, we, we done twenty to... minutes. We've done two <laughs> teams, which means right now we're on pace for a ten-hour pod, and that's not going to work. Um, all right, so let's go now to the Steelers, and then we can hit the rest of the league. And we'll go faster. Yeah, uh, they've never had uh, a free agency period that's been this eventful. This is the most interesting start to an offseason they're the type of team that would for years mock the teams that spent a lot of money and made the big moves this time of year and now they've become one which i think is fascinating so russell wilson patrick queen you trade deontay johnson i mean it's just they've never had a flurry of moves like can that. you explain the deontay johnson trade yes uh they didn't want him around they wanted nothing to do with the guy so wait so i were... thought so they have two malcontent wide receivers yes. yep Okay, so is there what? Mike Tomlin, the great players coach, has fostered a, a wide receiver room where he has complete knuckleheads and a holes all the time. Okay, so so they they, they traffic in that, they live in that. Chase Claypool, uh, Martavis Brown. Bryan, Antonio Brown, yes. Okay, so the what is we just did this with Chicago. We'll do it with Pittsburgh. What is the realistic ceiling for the Steelers? They have to win a playoff game. Win a playoff. They have game. to. They've gone seven years without one. So, but it, it, that's the that's what you're saying. You think they need to do in order to keep the status quo? Do you think that's realistic? What do you mean? To keep, what do you mean? I don't think they need. I think they'll keep the status quo if they go six and eleven. I don't think things will change. Okay, all right. The so, coach is like a pope or a Supreme Court justice. They never change him. <laughs> you know, I'm right about that. Yeah, it's ridiculous. No, you are. Okay, all right. Uh, do you are are you? If people again, first and pod folks know this. What's right? People might not. At the same time that I got the Never a Doubt tattoo, Andrew Filipponi got right on his hip, Kenny Pickett's face. And, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Actually, my ass. And, <laughs> and he now is... Well, I'll just ask you. Yep. Your optimism on Russell Wilson. Uh, cautiously optimistic, decently high. Okay. Not bad. So that he I can... feel better about their quarterback situation now than I did a week ago. Okay. And it was, Isn't that fair? Yeah, of course. He, I mean, Russell Wilson is better than Mason Rudolph and Kenny Pickett. The, that that is objective. Is, orders of magnitude. The, okay, so he is what percent to be the week one starter? Oh, ninety nine point nine. Okay, yeah, so it's, it's not be. a competition. No, it's okay. Well, I the, I'm asking you. I don't know for a million. Bucks. I think Russell Wilson, if he lost that competition, he would either ask to be released and traded to a team that maybe lost a quarterback because of injury or just fade off into the sunset and not play football anymore. Wait, is it actually take his Denver money? Is it even being framed as a competition? Yeah, because that's because they, they, they because if they use a first round pick on Pickett, I understand. Yeah, and they still have a bigger investment and because Pickett is they have him under contract and, for another year well, after this and, 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 and they don't rush. I think the biggest misconception is that it has to be one or the other. Now, you have to start with Wilson. But I don't think that starting the season with Russell Wilson means we won't see Kenny Pickett ever again. If if Russ 
gets off to a bumpy start or stinks. You bench him and you have like a 10 or 11 game runway to see what Kenny Pickett is. You kill two birds with one stone. Okay, so that... so right? I mean, you, you, it's a one-year, $1.2 million investment. You can achieve both. So, I yeah, so I think that is re- highly on the board of potential outcomes. I think that's high. That Russell Wilson is the starter, that he is the guy, and then he gets deposed because of poor play. Because we are, again, Russell Wilson's first nine years of his career, every year, played every game, every year, the team had a winning record. Three years in a row now, Russell Wilson has missed time, two of the years due to injury, one year because he got benched, and they've been below 500. So we are... We are getting approaching a full presidential term since the last time Russell Wilson was the guy that people, some people seem to want to believe he still is. And so I don't think he has a lot of leash. And the one thing I want to say about his contract, and then we'll do the rest of the league. I understand the $1.2 million makes sense for the Steelers, stick it to the Broncos. He gets the same amount of money no matter what. With that said, Russell Wilson unequivocally if it were out there, would have preferred $1.2 million this year with a substantial amount of money next year tacked onto a contract because that doesn't impact what Denver pays him and it gives him security. It's very clear to me no team in the league was willing to give him that. So this idea that, oh, he's only making the million because of the Denver situation. That's true, but he's on a one-year deal because no one else wanted to. But hold on. I don't think we know that. I think we know that no team would give him $30 million a year in in year two. How do we know that a team – how do we know that the Steelers didn't say to him – We'll give you a second year that's like a $15 million salary. And he said, no, I'd rather bet on myself, see okay. how it goes. I guess that's possible. And then get the Baker Mayfield contract, right? Uh, sure. Okay. If he, In that regard, I guess that's possible. Yeah. I mean, he's made it a gazillion dollars. So he's going to bet on himself to be a starting quarterback next year. And that's a ton of money. All right. What's next? So the next team we have here is Denver. And here's why I have the Broncos after this. We just talked about Wilson. Are they the last team left for fields? It feels like they're the only place where he could start tomorrow for sure if he just showed up. Be- but they don't have a lot of draft capital because of the Russell Wilson thing and because of the Sean Payton thing. I don't think you need a lot of draft capital no, to I, get fields at I, this point. I, 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 I don't either, but you still need to you need to give up something. And if you're trading for Justin Fields, it's only $2.3 million or whatever it is for this season, but are they going to bet on – we're going to trade for him, not pick up the fifth year option. He's better than Jarrett Stidham, and he leaves in maybe, a year. Maybe it's his third offense in four years. Maybe this the one time we do this, I'll end up saying something that's really dumb. Chances are good. I'm on. I'm under the impression that uh, Peyton wants no no part of that. So, I don't think Peyton wants Justin Fields at all. I think he has zero interest in doing that. So that's also. I just think Sean Payton. From what I've heard. The, well, so I, this isn't based on anything I've heard. This is just based on, you know, knowing what I know about Sean Payton and my gut intuition. I think he wants to have a more traditional quarter. People say, oh, he loved Taysom Hill. I brought that up on but the that's, podcast. But I think before. that's misleading almost. He liked Taysom Hill as an element of the team. And I also think, with respect to Sean, he liked the idea that if Taysom Hill turns into something, the amount of credit and love I will get for building this guy in. and he was like the toy that was there that you could yes. play with it wasn't Correct. it wasn't like a, a six month off season journey to to seek out Taysom Hill the, he was right he, he was there with Jameis and other guys and he was just like oh I can try Taysom Hill so why would the Giants not be involved they I mean I wrote I was working on a list of teams like He's he's better than Daniel Jones and Drew Locke. He's better than Will Levis. He's better than Jarrett Stidham. He's better than Sam Darnold, though obviously we'll get to them in terms of what they just traded for. He has certainly more upside than Gardner Minshew. There are teams where if Justin Fields was a free agent right now, I think that the Giants would have signed him over Drew Locke and let him compete with Daniel Jones. No question about it. But with Drew Locke, it just cost you money. This, it does cost you a draft pick and money. So since we're talking Broncos and we'll leave it here, I, one thing that happened that I found interesting is, and I think it's actually smart, so Russell Wilson's $85 million dead cap hit, they could have sp- split it up to where it was the majority of that hit the 2025 cap 
and less hit this year. They did it the opposite way, where the majority hits now, this coming season, and less hits the following year. I think that is smart. I think that's the right call. I also think it speaks to the fact I think Sean Payton might be looking at this year as a retool, rebuild, be awful, mind, be awful and be, you know what I mean? Sure. And, and try to hit the ground running in year three of his time there, which I think is the right move. I think if the Broncos, they're drafting 12th. I think if the Broncos all of a sudden take the little draft capital they have, try to move up, you know, and try to do things so they can target J.J. McCarthy or Jaden if he falls. Jaden wouldn't be a terrible idea, but I just think that would be a mistake. I think the Broncos have to take a longer view of it, which is why you're hearing names like Zach Wilson attached to him. It also That also is an argument for them to take a flyer on Justin Fields, but I just don't think Sean Payton and Justin Fields are going to be on the same team. All right, do we want to go ahead, Dan? Well, I mean, let's just get to, get into some of these teams, yeah. right? All right? You mentioned Curtis Samuel for the Bills. What do we think of the situation there in now at wide receiver? I mean, I, I think that we have to be honest about who Stephon Diggs is right now. So Stephon Diggs... The guy who fell off a cliff in the second half of the season, right? And I, was not targeted, was not trusted. But I, I the, the amount with which he fell off the cliff, I think has been underrated by the national media. The first six games of last year, Stephon Diggs in six games had... 49 catches, 620 yards, and five touchdowns. So he averaged over 100 yards, nine catches, and nearly a touchdown a game. So 620 and five. Yep. The final 11 games of last year, he had 560 yards, so fewer yards in the final 11 than the first six, and three touchdowns. And then in the playoff run, he had a total of 73 yards and zero touchdowns. So there is a there's a lot of questions with Diggs, which is do, the new offense, how much do they value him? Did he hit a wall? All of those things. Now, I don't think there's a big difference between Curtis Samuel and Gabe Davis, so I don't think there's a huge drop-off there. But my big take on the Bills is very simple, and I want to know where you guys stand on it. The only reason the Buffalo Bills are scary is because they have Josh Allen. And the idea that the their path forward is to minimize to lower Josh Allen's ceiling because they're afraid of the mistakes, that locks you into being just a team. You have to be like, God dog it, man. This is gonna be year six for him. Is that right? He was drafted one year after Mahomes. I think this is year six yeah. for him. Um no, this 2018, is year, 2018 draft. This is year seven for him, because this is year eight for Mahomes. Grow up. Give us the upside without the cartoonish mistakes. That's the only way we can be great. But they changed to that point. One of the most underrated stories in the NFL last year was when they fired Dorsey. McDermott forced onto that team a very run first. Yes, style and of play. I think that and I and think that puts a ceiling on him. I agree with that, but what I wonder is now that Brady is the full time offensive coordinator, is he allowed oh. to to expand the offense? Was that a byproduct of them needing to make the playoffs last year? Or is that who the Bills are this year? And if that's who the Bills are this year, if they're just gonna carry over that offense to this year, my prediction is they will maybe miss the playoffs, and Sean McDermott will get fired at the end of the year, and somebody like Bill Belichick will be their coach next season. Oh, I like and listen. I that I, I think all of that was interesting. I also think the other element for the Bills is you asked about their offense and the receivers. They are going to be for the first time of this era an average at best defense. You cannot draft as poorly as they have and have the lack of, uh, and the free agency losses that they had, and all of a sudden be a real defense the way they've been. So they are going to need, Danny, to have a great offense just to compete. They will. I don't think the idea of more balance for Buffalo is a bad thing, though. I know I'm the highest one on Josh Allen here, but like with Herbert in, in with the Chargers, they hire Harbaugh, they hire Greg Roman. Be like, Why are they hiring Greg Roman? How are you going to help Justin Herbert? He's all about running games. Like Giving Justin Herbert a running game would help Justin Herbert a lot. Giving Josh Allen some balance so he doesn't have to be 85% of the offensive production week in and week out, that should help reduce the mistakes because he doesn't have to be throwing every third and two. All right, we got to keep Falcons, going. Vikings, 
Kirk Cousins trade fallout and what that caused Minnesota to do uh, with the trade with Houston. So I think Atlanta is, I get why they are an odds on even money favorite in the South. I think it's a little crazy that Tampa is second, second three to one. Like, I don't think that the gap between Atlanta and Tampa should be that significant. But assuming Cousins comes back from the injury 100%, it's very hard to imagine a team, maybe going from Fields to Caleb, but that will have upgraded more at quarterback this year. And their defense is very good, and they will still be adding someone with the eighth pick in the draft, which might be the best defensive player in the draft. Or it might be they might move down and add, uh, you know what I mean, extra stuff for a team that wants to jump can, there. Can you just order. explain to me why the assumption is that he will come back from this injury and be the same guy he was before? I obviously it's a leap of faith. I don't I don't know the answer to that. He's right. he it they gave him over they gave him 100 million dollars guaranteed. So they have to have some confidence in it. He did that workout video on a tennis court, which is apparently impressive to people in the Achilles recovery community. I don't know. Listen, if he's if he's a shell of himself, then it's a, it's a big mistake. Of course. I, that's how I see it. And I think that is, not only is that a non-zero possibility, I would say that's a one in five. I would say there's a 20% chance. But not chance. much of what he does is based on athleticism or anything. It's just about snap throw, get the ball no, out. No, I understand. But, it, uh, but if the Achilles is not full strength or close to it, then he will, at, at his age, just not be the same player and they'll be cooked. But I just, I still think it was worth it. I think getting the stability at quarterback there with a good offensive line, three top 10 skill position guys that use three top 10 wep or draft picks in, in London, Pitts, and Bijan. I think, it, guys, also, here's the other th reason I think it's sneaky important. You got to make decisions on those guys in the next couple of years. Are yeah. you going to bring, uh, re sign Drake London? Are you going to re sign Kyle Pitts? And you need to give them stability there. If I if I were them, I would have made a push for Russ for a million dollars and had uh, him be a stopgap quarterback and dra and tried to get McCarthy in the draft to be my long term answer at the position rather than invest so much in a guy. Uh, there's this. I, I just I don't understand. I know the numbers are good with him year after year. He puts I, the ceiling on you. I, I don't agree. trust him whatsoever as a quarterback. I, I'm sorry. No, that's I don't. fine. But if you're Raheem Morris and you're like, man, I got a chance to be a head coach almost 15 years ago. It never got off the ground because of Josh Freeman. I'm just not going to walk through that door again. Can I'm we... just stopped that. I'm just sh shocked that the organization that watched Matt Ryan fall apart before their that's eyes. That's fair made this commitment All to right. Kirk Cousins. So the Vikings, if people don't know, the Vikings traded the 23rd pick. Uh, I'm sorry, the Dr Vikings got the 23rd pick. They traded away the 42nd, the 188th, and next year's second, which, which, is which is significant. So the Vikings are now sitting at 11 and 23. This means what to you? Well, I mean, I think the obvious connecting of the dots here, and you can look at any of the trade value charts that are out there, the old Jimmy Johnson one or some of the newer like Walter football ones, if they package simply 11 and 23, depending on which chart you trust, they can either get the third pick in the draft or the fourth pick in the draft. So that if New England is in, interested in trading out because they don't think they're ready for Drake May, they can trade up and get Drake May. Or if this is a situation like the Niners a few years ago when they traded up for Trey Lance, maybe they don't even know what quarterback is going to be there. They just know they're taking the third or fourth quarterback in this draft, and they're comfortable maybe, with either. Maybe it's a smokescreen, but everything I, I heard out of the combine was that the Vikings loved McCarthy. Everybody loves McCarthy. The other, yeah, I know. Yeah. but the other Taking him four would be crazy. The other connection is that Josh McCown was Drake May's high school football coach. But McCown's not going to be there. I'm sorry, May's not going to be there. If they I trade up to three. If they trade up to three, he could be there. Okay. All right, that's fair. If they trade up to three, that's right. The, so, Dusty, this great stats guy from First Things First, sent me this right after the Vikings trade, and I think it's noteworthy. When the Eagles traded up to get Wentz, before they traded up to get Wentz, they did a deal where they sent two players and the 13th overall pick to Miami for the 8th overall pick. They then packaged that to move up to number two. So they ended up trading the 8th, the 77th, uh, the 100th, uh, and a first and second rounder the next year to go from 8 to 2. But what they really traded was 
13 two players and that stuff to move up to two. So I do think it is setting the table yes. for a move up. All right, next. Okay, so Jaguars, Titans, Calvin Ridley now a Titan. We like it more for the Titans or bad for the Jaguars because the Jaguars roster management cost them Calvin Ridley. Their roster management is atrocious. Yeah, I I, I mean, I I don't think that that story is being uh, it's not being discussed enough because no one cares other than Nick and his Trevor Lawrence obsession. But like they've let him down. Thank you. Thank you. They've let you know what? Let's start that narrative (laughs) that Trevor has been let down. He has been. And the listen, Trent baalke has been bad a lot of places. And I, for the record, the 49ers, Jim Harbaugh, for the record, I don't like the Calvin Ridley deal for the Titans either. Well, they, I mean, I know that inflation cap going up and all of that, but it is tough to reconcile 50 million for Calvin Ridley and not giving AJ Brown, what, 57 million. Correct. Two years ago. And I know that I know there's a second round pick there and I know AJ Brown's a higher percentage of the cap because getting that money two years ago was different, but still. A.J. Brown is a significantly better football player than Calvin Ridley. I was was shocked by how much Ridley got based on his production from last year. The other problem for the Jags is they have the following four receivers. Well, and three of them are on extensions. One's on his rookie deal. Christian Kirk at $24 million on the cap. Zay Jones at eleven. Gabe Davis, who right now is at five because they did funny stuff there. And Devin DuVernay. That are those four receivers, in my opinion, you have one guy who is a f- a two in Kirk, and then you have three number three or four receivers. Their tight end and running back are probably better passing game threats than the guys they have at wide receiver. And, right? and so I don't get what the Jags are doing. I also don't get what the Titans are doing. All right, Raiders and Texans. We link these teams together because the two biggest impactful defensive players. Christian Wilkins to the Raiders, Daniil Hunter to the Texans. Which is the more impactful signing? Go ahead. I think it's Wilkins. I think it should be Wilkins. If it's not Wilkins, then something really effed up happened there. He's going to play on a line with Max Crosby. I mean, well, so that's the thing. That's got- and they, uh, they dressed what Tyree Wilson, right? Who didn't really show much. I mean, right? he was bad last yeah, year. Yeah, but it's a, like a high pedigree thing. Um, I think Will, Hunter's Wilkins, a touch overrated, by the way, but go ahead and make your point. Well, listen, I think that Hunter is a consistent high floor vet. It's Will, weird, Wilkins, though, that they basically flipped out Grenard. Jonathan Grenard for Donnell Hunt. I know. Yeah. So Wilkins, Wilkins is excellent. Premium position, prime of his career. Always has been awesome against the run. Just had his best pass rush season. Never misses games. Clearly, Christian Wilkins is the better player, which is why he got the bigger deal. I think the Texans thing is just a continuation, and it's their offseason has been fascinating. It's been aggressive. This is what happens if you have a rookie QB who hits immediately. Right. This is why you play the guys in year one. They now know for the next three seasons that they have – a top 10 will be conservative quarterback on a cheap deal. Yep. So for two years, guaranteeing Daniil Hunter, hey, I know I'm going to get 10 sacks. I, the, you know, like, I, like that, I, that, that is a very valuable thing. This is a C.J. Stroud signing possibility for the Texans. So th- I agree with that. I, listen, I also like cr- the Christian Wilkins signing a lot for the Raiders. I think the Raiders' offense is going to be one of the worst in football next year, and that's why they're not going to be good. Uh but I, I getting Wilkins there, I want to bring this back to the Chiefs just for a moment. I can't believe that. Uh, this is why I love the Chris Jones deal so much. Because I don't look at Chris Jones as $32 million a year, which is what it's three years, $95 million fully guaranteed is what the deal is. Because unless you have d- drafted a defensive tackle that's awesome on his rookie deal, the Christian Wilkins signing tells me the cost of doing business to get a top eight D tackle is he's twenty seven and a half million a year. Just call it twenty five million bucks. That gets you in the door because what did uh Matabuke go for? Like twenty four million a year? Yeah, you got a huge. Deal. So the cost of doing if you want a proven D tackle in this league, it's twenty five million a year right now. So to me, the question is not, is Chris Jones worth 32 million bucks? The question is, is Chris Jones enough better yep. than Matabuke or Wilkins yep. to, to make up for the fact that you now can't get a seven million, five to seven million dollar a year player? And the answer is 
unequivocally yes. Yeah, you can go naked at the position to say we're going to draft a guy or not, but if you want to have an impact guy at that spot, you're anchored at $25 million a year. So does he? it's not is he worth 32 It's is he worth the gap between him and the other guys? And to me, I, I think the answer is unequivocally yes. Dolphins-Cowboys, yes. off, bigger offseason loser, Miami or Dallas? I don't think Dallas is a big loser. They just didn't. They haven't done anything, Nick. Well, they did get Kendricks. Oh, they wow. They stole him away after oh. he had agreed to. Uh, well, let's amend that question and edit it out and throw it out. No, that's fine. That they but, got I, but the Cowboys were really good last year. Yeah. They, yeah. Mm-hmm. What? What? Tell me. Here's the. How many times does the season have to end the same exact way for it to not nullify or completely okay, so here's cancel my... out what happened in the 17 game regular right, season? Right. That's totally fair. But here's where I think you're being. Uh, intellectually dishonest. Is there anything they could have done in free agency that wasn't changed the coach or the quarterback that would change your opinion about them in the playoffs? Is yeah. there a move they could have made? You're like, well, okay, now yeah. they're well, you can't be play. Fine. You can't play the playoffs in March. So no, I, no, no, no. He's saying, I think what Pony was saying is. Okay, how many times do we have to see them have good regular seasons and flame out in the playoffs? And I, But the question was, were they a loser in free agency? So what I am saying is... They set an expectation that they were going to make changes from the very end of that Packers game, and they've done nothing. Right, but are there any changes other than the coach and quarterback that would make you more optimistic about them, their playoff chances next year? I mean, are you telling me that any big free agent move or trade was completely off the table for them because of like money. No, but what was it? What what could they have done? Well, I mean if Christian Wilkins was on the Cowboys. Them? Right. That's the, what I'm talking play. about. They could have gone out there and signed a huge defensive player or they could have signed Calvin Ridley or one of these running backs. I don't know. Something, Nick. <laughs> so Something the, that isn't what they're the doing. The defensive now. player thing I buy, Ridley or the running backs wouldn't have made it. Okay, any fair sense enough. Though. But I'm just saying like I, you're you're tr- you're trying to Back me into a corner here on, like, is there any? They've done nothing. Oh, so I still think Miami's far and away the bigger loser. Well, they, they've certainly lost the most, right? No team in the NFL has lost more. Yeah. Than, they, than they, Miami. I mean, I mean, they I signed Kendall Char- Fuller, but look at all the players. I guess the Chargers. The Chargers, maybe. You'd put, you'd put them there. The Chargers. Yeah, but that's Bills, offset by Harbaugh but, being hired as their coach. Listen, there. I think Miami's in a really rough spot. Yeah. I think the Miami's defense wasn't good. You talk about the, in the same every year with the weather getting let me, cold. Let, let, me, then, let me ask yeah. a spinoff question off of that then. Is the, is the percentage higher than 25% that in 2025 they will have a new coach and a new quarterback in Miami? I don't think that that's on the table. I you think don't? New, I think a new – well – I think I, it definitely is on the table. You I don't, don't think it's fifty fifty, but I think it's around. I think it maybe twenty five percent to a. Why? Third. Why would McDaniel be in trouble? It, why? Why wouldn't he be? Well, I mean, I think he's a good coach, and and I, the offensive production. But also, listen. I, I here's where I would be okay with McDaniel being in trouble if he greenlights them giving to an extension, and it seems like they're going to. At that, if you're the head coach and you have some power and you greenlight the extension, you then can't be like. You, I no longer will give you the benefit of the held back by the quarterback because you've tied yourself to him. Well, yeah, I mean, let's see how good their offense is this year. They still have Waddle. They still have Tyreek. They still have Tua. They still have McDaniel. If he goes three years without winning a playoff game and it's two one and duns and they go like 6-11 and 11 this year, I don't think he'll be back, and I don't think Tua will be back. Uh, reminder for the audience, if you listen on the first in pod feed, uh, I'm Nick Wright from FS1 and What's Right with Nick Wright. Uh, if you're listening on the What's Right feed, it's Danny Parkins. Danny, so they know your voice. Hello. There you go. And Andrew Filipponi. Hey, now. There you go. So the the you can you also, if you're a What's Right listener, should subscribe to the First and Pod uh, football podcast. All right. We got to really go fast. Yeah, we got to go very fast. All right. Ravens, Eagles, Packers. Which big name running back signing do you like the most? None of them. I like none of them. I you, think you don't that's think that's not the, the question. Pick one. You don't think that the Packers. Ravens would have been committed to a more balanced attack in the playoffs if they had Derrick Henry on the roster I think last the, year? I think the narrative surrounding that Ravens playoff loss is so hilarious, which is all year long, <laughs> if you were not laying flowers at Lamar's feet about sure how, uh, about what a brilliant passer he'd become, all of this, you were called a hater. Yes, and I then agree with that. in the playoff game. Everyone's answer is, how dumb were the Ravens letting Lamar pass? 
Well, they, they played right into the Chiefs' game plan, which was put the ball in the MVP's hands. And now the Ravens are, I think, tacitly admitting, okay, yeah, we kind of have to be a smash mouth run team. And I also, I just, I, I will take the under on Derrick Henry's production this year. I will do that. So I, I don't like that. So I if it would, said it, if it said it a thousand yards, you would go under that. Yes, I would not. I, I really don't like the Saquon deal. They paid him the exact money that Patrick Queen got. They need back seven guys, not a linebacker. I'm fine with the Packers because they're young and they, it's fine. Well, so I'm just, just, I'm surprised. I would say the Ravens. I'm surprised by the Packers one. I'm just surprised by it. Aaron Jones is awesome. They called him the best player on their team last year and he was dominant in the playoffs. I know Jacobs is younger, but he's old, like yeah. in terms of the, the wear on the tires. So I think Aaron Jones is awesome. So that one, that one surprised me. I think the Derrick Henry can I, signing Can I say something about Aaron Jones? He had 650 yards last year. Look at his playoff game log. I no, I get it. He kicked the Cowboys' ass. I understand that. Uh, I the I tend to when when teams don't want to bring back their own running backs. Sure, I know. tend to think they're right. All That's right, all. Jets. What is Aaron Rodgers doing? No. <laughs> I don't the, listen. I the, uh, the Jets. Here's the analogy I'll give. Because I, Robert Sala and Joe Douglas have to hate what's happened here. Oh, uh, yeah. But <laughs> they'd be fired without him. So what you have in New York is a, I would say, lower, a poor family. A family that struggles to make ends meet, whose 10-year-old just got cast as... The new Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> and is they are all of a sudden rich beyond their imagination. And around the time the second movie's coming out, the 11 year old now has figured out hold on a minute. He has I'm all the power. I'm in charge here. My parents can never get, ha, they, they only can live this life because of me. And I will do literally whatever I want and dare them to punish me because I'll turn the faucet off. That's what's happened. And Aaron Rodgers is the 11 year old drunk with power. Like, oh, we're going to talk about distractions out of the building, except I am going to allow to be floated. I might be the next vice president. We are going, I'm going to go on a podcast and talk about the fact that I think mountains used to be giant trees and, and, and all of this nonsense. And, and, and I dare you to do something about it. So I think the Jets are in the worst position of any team in the NFL. I'll just add to that because that analogy was brilliant. It's never good if you're going to AI to release a statement saying that you believed Sandy Hook happened. Yeah. That's a bad, just a bad uh, spot to be. We need to go very Giants fast. Giants and probably. Panthers, the Burns trade reaction. Carolina could have had two first-round picks for this guy in a second. In season. <laughs> what, what a disaster. You it's, think the Jets organization is a train wreck? Look at Carolina right now. The Bryce Young trade. My God. And the, not, the Brian Burns non-trade I, is all time. Can I give a counterintuitive take on that Brian Burns story? I agree with everything with, that people are saying. Good job by the Giants. I actually like it for the Giants. Good value. That's fine. The bigger story to me is... Not the bigger, but an underrated story is that would have been one of the worst trades ever. If the Rams would have made by it. the Rams, <laughs> correct? Yeah. The Rams offering two ones and a two for the league's eighth best edge rusher to only is, give him a hundred plus right, million is bananas. <laughs> you know what's interesting about that is that Les Snead had this impulsiveness to want to do that in season, and they've done next to nothing now. Yeah, no, I think that right. They, maybe sanity set in. All right, next. Uh, Lions and Niners, status quo good enough for some of the best teams in the NFC? I don't know if it is status quo for the Niners. I think that, you know, you lose Eric Armstead. You're, yeah, but you traded for the Houston defensive tackle to take his spot. Sure, and you added Martin. Leonard Floyd. I get that. I also, it's been quiet, but the Ayuk thing seemed to be a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and good enough to still be a playoff team? Like, the, sure. And for the Lions... I think that they're in great shape, personally. Yeah, I, think I agree completely. Gonna, th those, With Ben Johnson coming back. When you're that young of a team, you get better 
just by a year passing. You know what I mean? Just by those guys getting experience. Yeah, and Branch is back. Safety, he'll be he'll be recovered. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing for the Lions is that that Ben Johnson didn't take a head coaching job. So, yeah, somehow. I agree. I do not understand how that happened. Next. The Bucks. they kept the band back together. Can they win the South? They can, but I, I think, and I like Baker a lot, I think they overachieved a bit last year. And I think that they're probably in the same boat where... Can I ask you what, when you say, I like Baker a lot, what does that mean? What, like, for, for someone who likes Baker a lot, top what does that... Top 15 quarterback? Top 10? No, 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 no. I, I actually meant personally. Oh. <laughs> I meant personally. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I, sure. I think that teammates like him. I think he's a leader. I think he is tough as hell. Yeah. Uh, well, that cost him his job in Cleveland. Really. Right. And, but he is... To me, he is right at average. You know what I mean? If we were to, so you said top, he is at best 13th and at worst 19th, and he's probably 16th. I just think that the Falcons probably have correctly leapfrogged. What an incredible sense of loyalty from Mike Evans. I mean, the guy's going to go into the Hall of Fame. He'll play his whole career with the Bucks. He got his ring. What is it, nine straight 1,000 yard seasons yeah. at this point? Yeah. Guys, I, I, I thought that at some point he would look to do a Hollywood Brown deal, go give the chiefs a discount and try to get another ring and ring. Chains. I think because he has a ring, he doesn't need to. I know, but it's just, it's an awesome legacy. You just don't see it all, yes. a- anymore. Sure. All right. Bengals Browns. Are these Ohio teams any closer to challenging Kansas city? No. Okay. All right. Good. Good question. No, I mean, uh, do you think so? I think the Bengals are good. I'm I, w- they're good, but wh- how are they closer? Well, they they got ex- their, their defense sucked ass last year. I mean, let's just come right out and say it. It was awful. It, that had really not that much to do with Joe Burrow and their coach uh, Anna Rumo, who basically was like thought of as this Patrick Mahomes kryptonite coach. They went from having a defense that could stymie him to like being thirtieth in the league. So they brought Stone in, who had what seven or eight interceptions in Baltimore, and they signed someone to play their defensive line. So like they've made the moves around the margins to fill out their team. And the T. Higgins thing is yeah, just a T. Higgins, Higgins is the still T. Higgins there. The T. Higgins thing is the weird thing, it, and that's why I I have to see how that lands before I can give them a real grade. Is that everybody? That's everybody. All no, right, it's not. What? Oh, what do we have? Who did we leave out? Well, we left out Commanders and Seahawks. What's up with the Howell trade? Oh, I go ahead. You go. Ahead. I mean, it's just it's wild if that's a spot that also isn't available for Justin Fields because of Sam Howell, because they're saying. They came out and very publicly committed to Geno Smith with the guaranteed money. Did so, they? Well, like, saying all of that publicly, who cares? I, their actions speak louder than words. It's like to well, me, Sam Howell is not going to challenge Geno Smith to be the starting quarterback. I'm not saying he's going to challenge him to be the starting quarterback, but my guess is by Thanksgiving he's the he's the Seahawks starting quarterback. I disagree. Oh, I disagree. I don't think Sam Howell's good at all. I think that the I, the Commanders are obviously going to draft either Mayor. Well, wait a or, minute. If yeah. you're the Seahawks and you've got new coaches, right, and you get to the midpoint of the season and you're like four and four, and Geno Smith doesn't have a future there, why wouldn't you see what Howell has? Because you can see what Howell has by turning on his film for his entire NFL career. That's what I think. All right, Did one of these two people wrote a book. It's coming out in a few weeks. We discuss that next. What's right and the first in pod podcast crossover. All right, welcome back in. What's right with Nick Wright and first in pod. It's a first ever crossover episode we've ever done. This will show up on both of the podcast feeds. Danny Parkins, Andrew Filipponi from first in pod. And they're also going to be on first things first uh, on Friday. Uh, which depends on when you're listening to this. It's, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, Danny? Yes, sir. I couldn't believe you were doing this when you told me you were doing it. It was uh, it was a dumb idea. So I'm <laughs> holding this up to the camera. I, I Dumb idea is not the right word. It was, I know. It was a big ta- undertaking. Yeah. So Danny Parkins and his dear friend Ben Kaplan wrote a book called Pipeline to the Pros. And when I say wrote a book, not like a pamphlet, like a real long book. It comes out... With like a real publisher and stuff behind it. No, 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 a whole thing. Go ahead. It comes out... Yeah, it comes out April 16th, Pipeline to the Pros, how D3 small college nobodies rose to rule the NBA. Okay, so listen, I've read the book. It's outstanding. Jeff Van Gundy wrote the foreword. uh, And it is... Do you guys remember when we were in college and like 
I feel like and you tried was... to dunk a basketball and broke your wrist. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, that happened. That's not the story I was going to go to. Uh, I feel like it was a big thing at WAER, our college radio station. And now I don't quite remember it. It was called like the cradle of coaches or the cradle of quarterback. It was some area of Ohio that like all these. Co- Miami, Ohio was the cradle of coaches. And like all of these coaches came from all these NFL coaches. Yeah, came from. NFL. Okay. So. The premise of this book, well, I'm going to let Danny describe it, uh, but it is wild when you, when you get into the actual numbers and how division three college basketball had, how those guys have become some of the biggest power brokers in the NBA and what it teaches us about where the league is headed and how it got there is fascinating. So you go and explain it. Yeah. So I didn't know anything about this story, right? We went to Syracuse, but we have a very big, powerful alumni network of broadcasters, uh, much like, you know, Wharton Business School or Harvard Medical School. It's, it's a powerful network. Well, these guys who, for the love of the game, basically after high school, didn't want to give up the game, but had no dreams of playing at a Syracuse or a Duke or a North Carolina and were smart, went to these liberal arts colleges to get a good education. And it was the only place that they could play. And then they realized as the game in the league was getting smarter, that they had a unique ability because of their intelligence, how you have to teach the game at that level. You're more of a teacher than like a talent manager. And they also could speak basketball because it's a pretty damn high level of competition that they were uniquely qualified to be excellent coaches and front office members. A few years ago, 13 of 30 teams had either a head coach or a top decision maker, as in like president of basketball operations, the number one guy in an organization that had played or coached D3. So we're talking about yeah, give us some of the names. So we're, we're talking about like Greg Popovich, Sam Presti with the Knicks, both Tom Thibodeau and Leon Rose. Uh, The forward by Jeff Van Gundy, Stan Van Gundy. He hires Tibbs, Steve Clifford, uh, Frank Vogel, Mike Budenholzer. So all of these guys. So not just so not just the powerful guys, but some of the most well-regarded champion coaches or championship level coaches. Yeah, I mean, Kobe Altman, who runs the Cavs, Rafael Stone, who runs the Rockets. And so what we did was Brad Stevens, I talk to Brad Stevens for 90 minutes. I mean, so we talked to these guys. Brad Stevens was a D3 guy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so we talked to these guys and the network that they've created, we talked at this radio conference, right? We helped our friends yep. along the way. These guys helped their friends along the way. And it was once a couple of them got in, Jeff Van Gundy, and Greg Popovich uh, probably is the biggest modern names that you would know. They said, it really is just teaching. I just need people who can teach these guys. Basketball players want to learn. They don't care if you're six foot nothing, 150 pounds. If you can teach Patrick Ewing how to be better, or you can teach Tim Duncan how to be better, it doesn't matter that you could have never played at his level. And so that's the basketball side. The things that they've impacted in NBA history are incredible. But it's also, I think, it's like a management primer. It's a story of networking. It's about the value of a good liberal arts education. It's, uh, I I think people would really get a lot out of it. So listen, it is, if you're a big NBA fan, it it is, I think, one of the best in kind of unique idea NBA books to come out in years. Even though, but if you are watching this and you're not a big NBA fan, it is, if you it is applicable to a lot of fields yeah. about how to find talented people yeah. in maybe not the places you would initially think to. I wanted to ask you a couple other questions, though, because Will Hardy is a guy. I don't know if you mentioned him. Yep. Chris Finch, obviously. Yep. The, Talk to both of them for the, the book. Uh, and so when did this really start? Like, is there a you mentioned the Van Gundys, but was there a moment where you saw like, oh, it went from being there was one guy like this to a surplus of guys like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, so like in the post, so you can go back further, right, with like a Carl Shear or a Norm Sanju and like some of the guys like, like Carl Shear helped the, the Nuggets and the ABA transformation and bringing All-Star Weekend to the NBA, all sorts of like, you can go back in NBA history and find one-offs, um, Bill Musselman, guys like that. But Greg Popovich and Jeff Van Gundy, after them, they, I mean, they hired everybody. I mean, Sam Presti gets hired by Pop 
And then Sam Presti starts emailing these NESCAC schools, these Northeast liberal arts schools, emailing their coaches and saying, hey, do you have anyone on your staff but or on your on your team, on your roster or your managers who are smart and could apply like data sciences? And then he hires them to run it's their analytics department. It's kind of like what Belichick did for a lot of the D3 guy. It's It sounds remarkably like that. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very similar. And I mean, and br- bringing guys into the video coordinator rooms, coaching staffs have been expanded, the G League, all of that stuff. And so there's just, there's more opportunity now. It's not just, I got four assistant coaches and I've got to fill it with right. an ex-NBA player. It, all right, real quick before we uh, wrap up. Yeah. It, what's the pushback on this? By put not on your book, but on the I imagine there are some people that are like, yeah, and that's why guys who played in the league, who have real hands on the ground experience playing big time basketball, that there's not as much room for them. Is there a level of I don't know if resentment's the right word, but pushback or resentment or anything? Well, so we asked all these guys for stories about you know people challenging them and players not buying in and all of that, and it was a wide range. Like some guys were like, absolutely, like Hubie Brown talking about Oscar Robertson, like thinking he was going to drown him in an ocean. Talk to Hubie Brown for two hours and forty five minutes in the what book. Uh, Jeff Van Gundy though was like. I would have never been hired if it wasn't an interim job. No, no team would have ever believed me, but I got the interim job and I had humble superstars and Patrick Ewing vouched for me and then yep, ma- off and running. Ma- made his career. So those anecdotes are more on like a case by case basis, but there are a lot of unique challenge uh, challenges there. And then I would just also just like to say one more thing, like, uh, I'm donating the money that I make from oh, the book yeah. uh, to brain cancer research to brain up and honor my brother Brad. This you mentioned, like you couldn't believe that I was taking this on. Um, Ben's dad diagnosed with a rare disease after we started uh, the book. Passed away. Both my dad and brother passed away all during the process from like concept to publication. So it's a story. Like for us, it's an accomplishment of like friendship. It was a distraction, perseverance, and uh, we're hoping to raise a little bit of money for brain cancer research in honor of my brother. So also. the people, the first and pod crew knows uh, Danny's brother uh, about three and a half years ago was diagnosed. Yeah. About three and a half years ago was diagnosed with glioblastoma. I mean, I guess is... actually coming up on four and a half years ago. Oh, four. Yeah. My apologies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he. Yeah. Um, and made it for almost three years. Yeah, right? so he's, I guess, yeah, so we're coming out for you because he, he's been dead. He died last Easter, so yeah. yeah uh, and so that was, went through that entire process during the writing of this book. So he, as he mentioned, he, he, every dollar that he generates from this will go to the research to try to, which they've made real strides on just in the last, since I've been familiar with the last few years, but it is still considered an uncurable form Correct. of brain cancer. And so the book is pipeline to the pros. People can pre-order it now. Oh yeah. Pre-orders are going, pre-orders are going very well. And, uh, it's, it, you'd have it April 16th, April 16th, uh, right before Easter this year, right? Or right around, yeah, when, right right around, around Easter. Easter this year. Pipeline to the Pros, they can just Google it. Like, is there a website to go to? Or? Uh, yeah, just, just Google Pipeline to the Pros. It's available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, wherever you get your books, triumphbooks.com. But yeah, it's a, it's in my Twitter handle. It's the pinned tweet. You just Pipeline to the Pros, uh, you'll find it. Awesome. It's I we About a year ago on the show, we did Book Club. We then stopped it because I didn't really know how to do book club. I would just like to read chapters on the air. It was terrible podcasting. <laughs> uh, but this book is worthwhile for everyone. And I really hope the What's Right audience, obviously the first and pod audience, uh, checks it out. All right, fellas, we got to go. Great job, everyone. Thank you for the bonus episode. Uh, if you're listening on first and pod feed, subscribe to the What's Right podcast. If you're listening on the What's Right feed, subscribe to the first and pod podcast. We will talk to you guys soon. Hey, it's Nick Wright. Thank you so much for watching. Please do us a favor. Click subscribe. It helps my ego. And demonze has got a financial bonus writing on a number of YouTube subscribers. So help him out. And also, click the bell. I don't know what the bell does, but they tell me to tell you to click the bell. And your audio listeners, people that have commutes, drives, whatever it is, subscribe to the podcast as well, wherever you get the podcast. Same show, just, you know, just in your ears instead of through your eyes. All that. Check it out. Appreciate y'all.